And if I go on, the list is endless. Uh, he's, he's a passionate teacher, and he's very proud of being a recipient of the university level annual teaching excellence award in 2022 and 2023. He got his PhD from the prestigious Rice University, pretty, pretty close to here. And he got his bachelor from IIT Bombay. Uh, Kuldeep, the stage is yours. Please go ahead and enthrall us as you do all the time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Dharani, for the invite. Uh, I mean, I spent five years in Texas, so it's at least nice to be virtually back in Texas. Um, so I, I want to talk about a line of work that we have pursued for uh, past uh, four years or so. Uh, this work is at the intersection of um, formal methods of design automation and AI. So, um, you know, I do expect that there will be times when some of the things may not be very familiar. So please uh, interrupt me as I go along. Um, don't worry, I don't have too many slides, so there are enough time for the questions. Uh, this work was led by my uh, uh, PhD student who graduated and joined SISPI, uh, the tenure track faculty recently, and in collaboration with Subhajit Roy, who was Plinka's PhD co-advisor, and Frederick Silvoski uh, from TUVM. Okay, so with that as the backdrop, let me get started uh, with the kind of the statement of the problem. And uh, this is after all, uh, what Freder uh, put it nicely, the holy grail of programming. You know, when you think about how the programming should work like, you say, well, all I want to do is to state the problem and let the computer solve it. We are of course going to ground ourselves. In our case, we are going to focus on how do we specify the problem. We are going to say that, well, we can uh, write a specification. So this specification in a formal language. Throughout the talk today, I'm going to focus on a very specific fragment of this formal uh, language called propositional logic. So this is the Boolean logic that all of us see at some point in our high school. So we have a uh, specification. So what does specification mean? There are a set of constraints between input and output. Um, let's call X to be the set of input and Y to be the set of output. And we would like to design a system uh, that implements this specification. So such a system can be a program. So a program that takes X as input and Y as output should ensure that the specification or the constraints over X and Y hold true. It can be a circuit. And in much more general sense, what we are looking for are the functions. So what we want to design are the functions for Y in terms of X. So let me give a formal definition of this problem as I just described. So essentially you have a formula, a Boolean pr uh, propositional formula, which kind of suffices for most of this, uh, you know, systems that we are often interested in. For example, the circuits that we design, you can specify in some high level language and eventually it gets down to the Boolean logic. So this is the formula given to us and we would like to synthesize functions for each of the output variables. And what should, what does it mean that this function should implement specification? What it means is to say that for if, Whenever it is the case that for some x, if there exists a y, so that the specification can be satisfied. So think about for every, for every input, if it is possible to satisfy the specification, then it should be the case that if you were to substitute y with the uh, function, that would also satisfy the specification. So essentially you say, there is the specification between input and output. And I'm looking for some function that can ensure that this specification is satisfied. This is a very classical problem. Uh, in fact, the origins of this go way back to Bull's original work in Laws of Thought. So this has been studied for nearly 150 years. The decidability for this problem, so in computer science, uh, before um, the computer science as we know was invented, there was focus on uh, mathematical logic and uh, the decidability of this problem was uh, shown by Scholem in uh, early uh, 20th century. 
So each of these functions are also called scholar functions, and the set of these functions is called a scholar function vector. Let me give you some uh, concrete example to motivate uh, and show what these functions look like. So here is one such a concrete example. So we have a um, two inputs, let's say x1 or x2, and let's say there is one output, y1. And we would like to ensure that it should be always, here is the constraint that looks like, it says x1 or x2 or y1, okay? So now if I give you the following specification, you may as well ask like, okay, what are, uh, what's the possible implementation for this specification? One such possible function is essentially not of x1 or x2. Let's try to check if this is indeed a correct function. So what do we do? We go and substitute y with the function that we have. Okay, so what we have done is to substitute y with not of x1 or x2. And now we want to check, is it the case that for every value of x1, x2, is it possible to satisfy the specification by finding some value of y? And in this case, it turns out that if you were to assign y1 to true, then the constraint here would be satisfied. So for those who are not in formal methods, when I say a constraint would be satisfied, I would like this formula that I have to evaluate to true or one. So this is indeed one possible implementation or one possible column function. Uh, because as you can see that for every value of x1 or x2, it is indeed the case that if you were to substitute y with not of x1 or x2, it would also evaluate to true. It turns out that there can be many such uh, functions out there, and that becomes a very important problem as we'll go along in the rest of the talk. There are functions that are just not of x1, there are functions that is not of x2, or there are functions, constant function also suffices. So what you could say is that, well, the function that I should have implemented was just constant. So for every value of x1 or x2, it should uh, just give rise to answer one. So there can be many such uh, uh, functions out there. So I think at this point, this is kind of the formal definition. It would be nice to visualize this problem in many contexts. So suppose you are designing a system and you design, you specify the safety constraints. So this is the specification that says, here are the safety constraints out there. The system must be safe in all the scenarios. So there are many possible implementations of the system that satisfy the safety scenarios. You often also want to optimize on uh, some, uh, you know, you are designing a system, there are resource constraints over which you would like to optimize, and there are safety constraints that you would like to always satisfy. So who cares about this problem? Well, there's a long, long history about this problem. There are many, many uh, applications for it. In logic, this is kind of the, a fundamental problem, which is to eliminate quantify. So what do I mean by eliminating quantify? If you look here, we had a quantifier exist y, and it's possible to eliminate this quantifier by substituting y with f of x. Quantifier elimination is the core of the um, symbolic equation solving, because that's how most of the uh, symbolic solving work you eliminate variables and eliminating variables is eliminating quantifiers. There's a, also a long line of work on synthesizing circuits. So if you think about how the circuits uh, or the system that we design work, somebody comes with a high level specification, then you come up with these functions and then you go on to optimize these functions in the layout and then you finally fabricate and uh, verify and ship it. This is also turns out to be important in program synthesis. So there's a very recent, lot of work over past uh, decade in the field of program synthesis, where you want to write that, I want to synthesize a program that computes certain um, a function, and then uh, that's your specification. And this function that we are computing is the program you are looking for. So many such 
very different applications can be translated into uh, functional synthesis. The problem is known by many names. So Alonzo Church, uh, the uh, famous um, a mathematical logician, uh, after whom church during the thesis is known, stated this problem in his letter to von Neumann in 1957. So this is also called church problem. As I mentioned, this is program synthesis. You can also think of this problem that arises. Uh, this problem also arises in case of synthesizing strategy for the games. So you can think of like you have a specification where there are two players. So X is the player that is trying to falsify the formula and Y is the player that is trying to satisfy the formula. So this is at the core of the uh, zero sum games where you have two players, one that is trying to falsify and the other that is trying to satisfy. So when the problem has many names, then there's no surprise that there's a lot of work and there are many, many techniques to solving this problem. There are techniques uh, based on uh, what are called proofs of validity. There are techniques based uh, in formal methods from satisfiability modular theory. There are techniques uh, from knowledge representation, which is a major field in AI. There are techniques based on incremental determinization and so on. And that means that there is a lot of progress that has happened over the years in solving this problem. But despite all this progress, what remains a major challenge is the scalability of these tools. So in uh, formal methods uh, and in automated reading in general, uh, if you develop a technique, then you have much uh, bigger problems to solve and there's the scalability always remains the major challenge here. So I think at this point, I would like to pause and uh, make sure that all of uh, Everybody uh, is um, okay with the problem statement because rest of the talk is going to focus on how uh, over past few years we have gone about solving this problem or the uh, motivation for this problem. So this will be a good time to pause before I get into what we have been doing over past few years. I can state, I leave the definition here. Maybe if there are questions. Yeah. Um, are there any questions? If there are not, Remember, rest of the talk is going to focus on this problem statement. So please make sure you are comfortable with it. All right, so just to make sure we are on the same page, you are given a specification and you want to implement this specification using a function, a circuit or a program. What it means is that you should be able to substitute the circuit so that it satisfies the specification more formally for every input. If it is possible to satisfy the specification, then it should be the case that if you were to write substitute y with f, it would also satisfy the specification. Perhaps one other example that might be useful is you can simply write a factorization. You can say that I would like x to be product of y1 times y2 and y1 and y2 both should not be one. In that case, you are looking that can you come up with a circuit that implements factorization. Factorization is kind of the classical uh, hard and important problem in computer science. <laughs> Uldeep, I think there is a question on the chat. I don't know if you're able to see that. Ah, uh, yes. No. Uh, we can read out Yes. Um, so the question about uh, from uh, Julian. Yes, uh, we are indeed interested in designing a system that can um, that is able to come up with uh, the function for certain specifications. Yeah.
Also, the another question about what's the difference between a normal function and a column function? There's no difference. It's just that these functions uh, we call as column function because of this, uh, the way we have stated the problem. Since column, uh, well, bit of a theory here, so bit of a history. So, a column, uh, a famous logician proved that there always exists such functions. So, it was not clear in the early 20th century that is it is it possible to always have such functions exist right so this is kind of precursor to the decidability results and scholem showed that there always exist such functions so you might ask that can you come up with a specification for which there is no implementation possible and the answer turns out to be no for uh, propositional logic and uh, broadly also uh, in case of first order logic Okay, so um, I want to talk about a different um, approach that uh, we have taken over the past few years. And this approach was motivated by uh, three progress that, uh, that happened in uh, 2010. So there was a lot of effort in building samplers. So samplers are you give a set of constraints and you are able to sample from this set of constraints. This is again a very hard problem, but there is a lot of progress that has happened over the past few years. And of course, everybody in the room knows there's a lot of progress in the data-driven machine learning methods. And similarly, there has been very exciting progress in the field of uh, symbolic reasoning or formal methods. So we uh, sought to come up with an approach that can rely and can use uh, the progress in these three domains. And let me introduce you to the approach that we have focused on. And before I talk to you about the approach, I think here is the kind of key takeaway that I hope you'll be able to uh, take by the end of the talk. So when we started working on this problem, I remember seeing this chat, uh, sorry, this uh, Twitter message uh, from Franka Scholle, who is uh, the person behind the develop, who developed Keras library. And, uh, he mentions it very nicely in the sense that machine learning usually is able to come up with the early demos of application, but where it really struggles is to get consistent usefulness and reliability required for final uses. And the key takeaway message uh, would be for uh, this talk is that in some ways, I think machine learning and formal methods are made for each other. So formal method can step in where machine learning struggles. So we are going to, I'm going to show all this through our work in uh, for one particular domain where we rely on machine learning to give us initial demo and then we rely on formal methods to be able to really come up with something uh, that can be certified to be correct. So that will be the meta lesson for uh, from this presentation. There's a question from Julian that are these functions represented as algorithms? Yes, uh, I mean, functions, algorithm and function are the same definition. Uh, so you can think of an algorithm as essentially, um, you know, something that takes input, just like the way a function takes, and whatever is the output of the algorithm is the output of the function. So I'm stating problem much more broadly, but of course, when you really look at what we implement, these are the circuits. You can write those as programs. So uh, I have a question for me. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, yes, I can hear. Yeah. So when you say the usefulness and reliability where ML suffers, can you give some examples what you mean by that in the production usage? So uh, let me kind of go through the uh, talk and then we come back to it about them. Yeah. That's a very good point, and I, I hope to convey this uh, to the Okay, so here is, now with that as a backdrop, here is uh, the approach that we have developed. We call it Manthan. So how does it start? We start with, a, uh, you know, we have a specification. From this specification, we are going to generate the data. And this is where we are going to rely on the power of uh, samplers that have been developed over the past few years. Once we generate the data, we treat 
the synthesis problem as that of a classification problem. So we are going to rely on the advances in machine learning. I'm going to talk about the solution, um, the initial solution that is based on um, scikit using off-the-shelf uh, machine learning techniques. Uh, there is now a lot of interest in scaling it to other techniques such as neural networks and so on. Once we have learned these candidate functions, well, we know that they can be good, but we really wanted to come up with functions that were always correct in the sense that for every input, they should be able to give a correct output. And this is where we are going to rely on the advances in symbolic reasoning. In particular, we are going to first check whether these functions are correct. If the answer is no, we are going to repair them. And we'll go through this loop until we are able to certify that the functions that we have are always correct in the sense that for every input, they are going to give a, a output that satisfies the specification. So remember, we have a specification given to us, which is set of constraints. It's in some high level language. You can translate all the way to the uh, propositional formula. So you get a set of constraints to start with. And then finally, we, have a, uh, we are going to come up with the functions that uh, realize this specification. So for every input, they are going to be able to output uh, so that the specification holds. Okay. All right, so let me kind of uh, give you a quick overview of how all of this works out and then we'll dive deep. So we start with a specification. From this specification, we are going to generate the data. This data is essentially all the points. Oh, these are all the points, uh, values of x1, x2, y1, y2 that satisfy this specification. Now, once we generate this data, you can say that we can try to look this as a classification problem. In particular, for every y, we can try to synthesize a function in terms of x1, x2. Or you can also do for uh, y1, you can have a function in terms of x1, x2, and for y2, you can have a function for x1, x2, and y1. So we are going to synthesize these functions. In particular, I'm going to talk about approach based on decision trees. We get these decision trees. We can translate a decision tree into a um, Boolean formula just by walking to the leaves. And now we have these functions that we can. We are going to rely on. Now we are going to go and check whether these functions are indeed correct. How can we do such a check? We are going to come up with a formula, which I'm going to call as error formula, which is E of x, y, f. And the property of this error formula is going to be that if this formula is satisfiable, then there exists a counterexample. What does a counterexample mean? It's going to find a valuation over input for which the function will output something that does not satisfy the specification. Whenever we have a counterexample, we are going to repair it and we'll go through the repair cycle until we reach a point where this error formula is unsatisfiable. Error formula being unsatisfiable means that it is there is no possible counterexample. So uh, for every input over x, the output of f satisfies the specification. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to dive in uh, deep into each of uh, these three stages of the uh, process. And in each of those, I'm going to talk about the process that we took. I think there's a lot of opportunity for questions, both from machine learning as well as from formal methods. By no means, these are the optimal heuristics or optimal approaches. So I hope to get some of you interested uh, and excited about some of the open questions. So the first stage is generating the data. And in this case, you can say, well, how should I generate the data? And this is where 
the setting becomes a bit different from the classical learning theory setup proposed by Valiant in 1980s. So remember, we have a relational specification. What do I mean by relational specification? For every value of x1, x2, there can be many possible values of y1, y2 that satisfy this specification. This is very different from the setting proposed by Valiant, where for every value of x input or x, there would be a unique value to the label or uh, to the values of y. And in the former setting, uh, there's a lot known. For example, you should just randomly sample points over this space, but the same strategy does not hold true. And in our case, uh, there's a very good question from Samson. Yes, we do allow the case. Uh, so the question is that, is it possible that for some value of X, there's no value of Y? Yes, it is indeed possible. And in such case, we wouldn't uh, worry so much. So you can think about in case of prime factorization, if the number is prime, then there are no trivial, uh, there are no non-trivial factors and that's okay. So we, we want to factorize only when it's possible to factorize into uh, non-trivial factors. Okay. All right, so let me showcase why does the classical wisdom no longer works in uh, this setting. So here is a specification. This is really the specification we saw earlier. In particular, we have uh, the specification of, uh, you know, what we saw earlier was X1 or X2 or Y1. And now we also have not of X1 or not of X2 or not of Y2. So let me write the truth table for it. So what's the truth table? For every value of X1, X2, let's see what are the possible values of Y1 and Y2. So when X1 and X2 are 0, 0, there's only one choice for Y1. It must be 1. Similarly, when x1 and x2 are 1, 1, so if you substitute 1 and 1, then remember not of 1 is 0, not of 1 is 0. So then for y2, there is only one choice, which is 0. And for everything else, the y1 and y2 can take uh, different possible, both 0 and 1. So if you were to just randomly sample, then a uniform sampler may output something like this, you know, for every value of Wherever it could take zero or one, it might just with probability half to zero and so on for y2. And then maybe there is a method to learn these functions. And uh, such a method can learn a function of this, the following form. And which is okay. I mean, remember, this is a correct column function. So what can be wrong? What can go wrong? Well, we are in. At the same time, there are many possible simpler functions out there. As we saw earlier, there are functions like just not of x1. There's a function that is just not of x2, or in fact, even constant function. I'm showcasing an example where there are only two uh, variables. In real world cases, you have about few thousands of input variables and few thousands of output variables. If you generate, if we generate the data for which only complex functions can be learned, then you will need to generate a lot of data. So we would ideally like to generate the data that allows us to learn simpler functions. The simplicity I'm talking about in the description of these functions. So for example, constant functions are easy to specify. Is there a question or? So what kind of a sampler we are looking for? Well, a magical sampler would somehow figure out that whenever there's a choice for y1, it should take value one. And whenever there's a choice for y2, it should take value zero. But we don't know a priori that we should be making such choices. The filters were, I didn't mean that they were never in the Okay, cool. I see a lot of life in them, so, but yeah, I got everything for the free. Okay, I'm gonna end this minute. Mike, you probably want to mute. Yeah. So in, in this case, 
what a medical sampler should somehow be able to figure out that whenever there's a choice for y1 it should take value one and whenever there's a choice for y2 it should take value zero but we don't know of such a medical sampler we can't just look at the formula and be able to guess such a thing so then what do we do well we rely on what is called weighted sampling in ai you often uh, one often calls it a sampling from prior uh, which is a product distribution so how do we uh, specify such a product distribution you can for every dimension you can describe a bernoulli distribution and now the product distribution is just taking the product over all the dimensions in particular this is also called weighted sampling. So for every variable, you specify a weight. And then weight of an assignment is the product of the weight of uh, the variables. So for example, if we were to specify the weight function that is uniform for x1 and x2, but it biases for y1 to take value towards 1 and y2 to take value towards 0. So you are writing, you are writing weight of 0.9 for y1 and weight of 0.1 for y2. In such a case, weight of sigma 1 is just really kind of 0 0.5. So sigma 1 is assignment that assigns value 1 to x1, value 0 to x2, value 1 to y1, and value, uh, sorry, value 0 to y1, and value 1 to y2. And this is what the weight would look like. So uniform sampling is really a special case where all the variables are assigned weight of 0 0.5. Okay. So what do we do? Here's a heuristic that uh, we came up with, but uh, there's a lot to do even in trying to prove the optimality of uh, optimal strategy and so on. But I'll tell you what we came up with. We initially generate samples by biasing every variable, every y variable towards one. And then we also generate set of samples by biasing every variable, y variable towards uh, zero. For x variables, we say uniform distribution is fine. Then we get this set of samples, and based on this set of samples, we compute the weight for each of the x and y variables. Well, for each of the x, the weight is still 0.5, but for yi, we compute different weight. Once we compute these weights, then we can generate rest of the samples relying on this weight function. Now, one question that comes about is that, well, are there samplers out there that can handle uh, such constraints? So of course, finding just finding just a satisfying assignment itself is the canonical anti-complete problem. But uh, there's a lot of progress that has happened over the past few years in being able to sample solutions. And we rely on this progress to be able to build on uh, the sampler that has been proposed. Uh, I'll go back to answer a question from Samson about these queues. So we have some heuristics about these queues. Probably we can talk, uh, up, um, you know, after the talk, I can I can show you the precise heuristic that we have. But each of the QIs are just numbers between zero and one. All right, so I talked about the first stage, which is that you start with a specification and you generate the data. And I think, um, and once we have this data, it can now allow us to use learning techniques. So in particular, we rely on uh, decision trees. So what, uh, what do we do? We have the data, and now we can treat this as a classification problem. So you can say that, well, I am going to treat Y as the labels and X as the features. So we can say, let me try to learn y2 in terms of x1, x2, and y1. And then I'm going to learn y1 in terms of x1, x2. So you can see that you want to learn decision trees uh, for each of the uh, output labels, uh, output level variables. Of course, there are more heuristic that we are designing over the years, but this is kind of gives the high level idea. So what we get? From this data that we have, we can learn a decision tree. From the decision tree, we have to extract a function out. So how do you extract a function out from a decision tree? 
Well, you can, all you can do is to just look at every leap. So you can say that if I take the path, which is not of x1 and not of x2, then the function should output value 1. And similarly, if I take the path x1 and not of x2, then it should output value 1. And everywhere else, it outputs value 0. I want to mention that you can think about decision trees in a slightly different manner. And you can think of decision trees as a one-level decision list. Why am I calling it as a one-level decision list? So decision list is this if else. And you can see that we can reorder P1 and P2. So P1 is a path uh, which was not of x1 and not of x2. And P2 is a path x1 and not x2. So these paths can be reordered. That's the property of decision uh, trees, that the paths do not conflict with each other. So there's only one real level of this decision list. I'm going to come back to it uh, when we talk about repair. So one of the interesting questions that came about when we were working on this is what kind of learning we should use? Because from the traditional machine learning settings, there's no noise here. Every value of x, every sample that we have generated indeed satisfy the specification. So you could argue that we should not make any error. But at the same time, data that we have, the set of samples we have generated is only a small subset of all possible solutions. Remember, you have about few thousands of x variables. So the space of possible assignments is two to the power few thousands. So of course, we cannot generate uh, such a large data. We generate just few 10,000 uh, uh, samples or so, because sampling is still an expensive operation. So it turns out, which shouldn't surprise a lot of uh, people in audience who are from machine learning background, that it's better to learn with errors. So it's better to make some errors on the data that you have in the hope that you can generalize to the uh, entire space that we haven't seen so far. This was a bit surprising from the formal methods perspective because in formal methods for a long time, there was a lot of proposal about doing abstraction. So what does abstraction mean? You either start with the over approximation or under approximation. You don't make errors on both sides. Let me show you what it means. Either you one should start with a function so that Wherever the variable should have taken value one, the function also takes the value one. Or you start with the under approximation, which means that wherever the function takes value one, the variable should also uh, take value one. But in this case, we make two-sided errors. In particular, it's possible that the correct answer is one, but the function that we have learned gives the answer zero and vice versa. And that turns out to be very important uh, later on because it allows us to do repairs much more effectively. Okay, so that was the part about learning. So we have data. We can now, because we have the data, we can treat this as a classification problem. And because we, have, uh, we are able to treat this as a classification problem, we can rely on off-the-shelf techniques to be able to learn these candidate functions. So we have learned about, you know, few, remember, as I said, that the number of x and y variables are in order of few thousand. So we have learned a few thousand of these functions. Now we would like to be able to be sure that these are indeed column functions. How can we check that they are indeed column functions? Well, this is a problem that can be specified very formally. We can construct a new formula. And what does this formula say? It says that, well, here's the formula, phi of x, y, and negation of phi of x, y prime, where y prime is same as f of x. Let me help you to read what this formula says. It says that, is it ever possible that there is an assignment over x and an assignment over y so that the specification is satisfied? But if you were to substitute the output of the function, then the specification would be falsified. Okay, Is there an assignment over x 
and an assignment over Y. So is there an input and output so that the specification is satisfied? But if you were to substitute the output generated by the function, then the specification would be falsified. So if there is such an assignment, then of course, what we have synthesized is not correct. And if there is no such assignment, it means that for every value of X, the output of uh, the formula F satisfies the specification. So this is indeed correct scholar function. So as it turns out that the learning techniques are powerful, but they are not able to be 100% accurate we tried lots of strategies in particular. Sometimes we try to generate a lot of data. And even then you see that they always make some error. So just trying to rely on the data generation learning didn't seem that we can reach this stage of being accurate everywhere. So you can get accuracy that's something like 70, 80, 90, 95% accuracy, but you are not able to be fully accurate. And why do we care? Well, a lot of these applications where the community are interested, as you might have seen in the publications, is in design automation. And as the design automation industry knows very well, if you ch ship chips that have errors, you might have to recall and it costs you billions of dollars. So the industry truly cares about having these functions or the chips that are fully accurate with respect to the specification. Uh, there is a question from Samson. In fact, uh, what about the other case? The specific is not satisfied for Y, but it's satisfied for Y prime. Well, it's not. So if the specific is not satisfied for by Y, if they know such Y, then of course it's also not possible that there is some output of the function that can satisfy the specification. But if you just look at the assignment of X and Y that doesn't satisfy the specification, the formula is already unset. So that doesn't have to worry about. Remember the satisfiability case of this formula to be set, the error formula E is satisfiable when there exists, even if there exists one possible case over X so that uh, X and Y so that the specification can be satisfied, but if you were to substitute the output of F, it wouldn't be satisfied. Okay. Right, so now there's a, um, I want to take a pause and I want to now press all of this from the classical learning theory. So um, in the classical learning theory, Valiant proposed this notion of equivalence oracle. So there's a notion of you generate the data, you try to learn some function, and then you have access to what is called equivalence oracle. So what is an equivalence oracle? You can say, hey, here is the function I have. Is it a correct function? And then the equivalence oracle is able to give, say, answer yes or no, and can also give you a witness. It can tell you that, look, here's the input where you are making a mistake. So uh, the setting that we have here allows us to have such an equivalence oracle in practice because the set solvers are powerful, so they can do such queries. But where it becomes interesting is that what should you do with this assignment? So for example, let's say the, um, the so we are going to do a call to a set solver and the set solvers uh, become fairly powerful so they can handle such formulas. And it comes back and says that, hey, you know what? Whenever x1 and x2 are 1, 1, I know that I can satisfy the specification by assigning y1 and y2 to be 1. And the function you have learned is giving output to be 0. So now you say, well, what are all the functions I should be uh, repairing? You can say that, well, I should repair all the functions where why I do not agree with why I prime. But remember there, we have a relation, not a function. P is a relation. So what it means is that for some assignment to X, there might be many possible Y that can satisfy this relation. So what if there was 
another possible assignment that would say that when x1 and x2 are 1 1 it is possible to satisfy the specification by assigning y1 to 0 and y2 to 1 if we knew that that's possible then we would never go and repair f1 you would we don't have to repair the function for the first y i variable right so how do we search for better counter example It turns out this is a problem that can be formulated as a max set. So max set is the problem you have a set of constraints and you want to satisfy as many constraints as possible. So what we can say is that we can say that, okay, I want to fix the assignment over X, but I want you to find an assignment over Y that can agree as much as possible with the outputs of the current candidate functions I have. And once we have such an assignment, we get a better counterexample to fix. So I think this is a very interesting setting uh, compared to the classical learning theory, where because you have a relation, then you can have this notion of better witnesses to the equivalent queries. So in particular, you can say that, well, for a given assignment over x, there are many possible y variables, and uh, there are many possible assignments over y variables. And perhaps I should repair with respect to the assignment that uh, does not require me to change too much of my current candidates. All right, so let's say that we were able to find such assignment. Now we have to repair the function. So what does repair mean? One way to do such a repair is to say that, okay, this is uh, a technique uh, that has been known in formal methods for over two decades. Uh, it's also now being used in a lot of machine learning settings where you put a guard. What does it mean? You say that, well, whenever x1 and x2 and not y1 happens, then y2 should be 1. And everywhere else, you can continue to use the current uh, function that we have. Ideally, we should be doing a repair that can also fix potentially other counterexamples. So in particular, it would be nice if our repair could say that if x1 and x2, or it could even just say if x1, but we want such repairs to be sound. So how can we find such sound repairs? Well, it turns out that we can construct another formula Another formula that we construct is to say that we have the specification and say that, you know what, I really want to say that when x1 is 1 and x2 is 1 and y1 is 0, I really want y2 to be uh, 0. Of course, the solver comes back and says, you are being crazy. What are you talking about? If x1 is 1, you can't even have y2 to be uh, 0. Well, in that case, we know what is our beta. So the solver gives an explanation to us where we are going wrong. So this is also uh, the technique that is under uh, at the core of abductive explanation that have been proposed recently in the machine learning literature in explainability. So unset core is the concept um, that's known in uh, symbolic reasoning and formal methods for over two decades. And that's same as what, what is uh, called abductive explanation. So it tells us that, you know what, if, if you have x1 to be 1, even at that point, you must have y2 to be 1. And if we know that, then we can come up with a better repair immediately. OK. <clears throat> So while we are doing this repair, the functions that we have are changing. So what's happening? We initially started with a one-level decision list. And now we are making these repairs that look like if beta 1, then 1, if else, uh, if beta 2, then 0, and so on. And all these repairs are sound, which means that we can reorder all these repairs. So what happened is that we went from one-level decision list to two-level decision list. And why does that matter? Well, we know from theoretically that two-level decision list can succinctly represent a larger class of functions than what one-level decision list could do. 
So something that was interesting here is that we could start with machine learning to learn simpler functions, which is one level decision list. And then we could rely on symbolic reasoning to be able to take these simple functions and build more complex functions. Okay, so here is the entire approach I put together. We start with a specification, we generate the data. From the data, we learn the candidates. From these candidates, we go on to check if the functions that we have learned are correct. If they, for this, we can construct a formula, call a set solver. When we call a set solver, it's going to tell us that there's a counter example. If there's a counter example, then we can go on to repair uh, the function that we have. We go through this until we are finally able to reach unsatisfiability. Unsatisfiability here is a good news. It says that it could not find any counterexample. There's a lot of progress in the development of set solvers or set solvers or the constraint solvers that not only tell you that it could not find, they also give you a certificate that there is no such counterexample. So you actually get a certificate that uh, the function that you uh, uh, come up with is indeed a correct column function. Okay, um, now I think one wonders, well, sure. I mean, there's an idea, you can combine the techniques from symbolic reasoning and uh, machine learning, but does all of this work in the real world? So here, uh, when we started working on uh, uh, this uh, line of work. There's a well-established set of uh, benchmarks in the community. There are 609 benchmarks that come from different applications, including factorization, because factorization is kind of the major challenge. And we compared our tool with the state-of-art tools. And the timeout is uh, two hours. So two hours is from the point you give a specification to do everything and it should be able to come up with uh, a correct uh, scholar function. So I'm going to show this on a plot that's very popular in formal methods communities. Uh, it's called cactus plot. So let me help you to read it because this is not so much well known outside the community. So on y axis, we have the runtime. On x axis, we have the benchmarks. So what it means that the tool could solve 200 benchmarks, each of them in under 2000 settings. Okay, so you, it could solve, by solve I mean for each of those, it could find this column functions. And for each of the benchmark, it was able to do so in less than 2000 seconds. So this is how, the progress over five years from 2015 to 2020 looked like. So we went from having the tool that could solve about 206 benchmarks to 280 benchmarks. The work we did over three years or so, we are able to solve 509 benchmarks. In fact, at this point, the tool that we have built, which is open source, it's able to solve every instance that is solved by any other method, and these are the methods that come from very different approaches. So almost every benchmark that can be solved by any other method can be solved by uh, the tool method. So- Are they not both spatial and temporal in nature? Sorry? Are these benchmarks primarily spatial or do they have temporal characteristics? Uh, these are the benchmarks that are much more, uh, uh, you know, combinator or special, there are no temporal uh, operators here. So that's that's an interesting next level of problem, which is called reactive synthesis. So you can think about the system that we have right now is a one shot, you know, the kind of circuits you have, right? You have input and output. You would also like to synthesize a system that can, when it takes some actions, the input changes and you have to keep uh, making other uh, changes. So that's a, a next level problem to work on. But these are combinatorial benchmarks.
Okay, I want to now quickly go over some of the different choices we made, just to kind of show you that these choices have a lot of effect on the performance. And also to motivate, there is a lot of here, a lot of new open directions here to look into. So in many ways, I kind of think that it's a complete wild west at the intersection of symbolic reasoning and machine learning techniques. There's a lot of exciting work to be done. So here's the first choice, which is you ask, well, how, how much is the quality of samples that you generate, the data that you generate matter? So yeah, of course, sampling is a hard problem. So you can have samplers that are very fast, but don't generate distributions that are uh, you know, truly uh, close to the prior that we wanted, or the sampler that can generate distribution that are close to the prior that we wanted. Uh, sorry, posterior that we would like. So it turns out that the sampler that don't have guarantees, if you were to just plug in the sample generated from those samplers, then we end up solving much fewer problems. So the quality of samplers matters quite a bit. The other major difference that we had is from the classical learning setting, which is searching for a nicer counterexample. So when the equivalence oracle gives us a witness, not doing a repair immediately, but trying to search for a better counterexample with respect to which, if you can do a repair, that can generalize. Again, it turns out that if you were to take out that component, then you end up solving just about 400 instances. The third aspect that turns, uh, that was an important choice was to not rely on abstractions. So in particular, make two-sided errors. So which was, remember we said that we start and there's a choice whether you should make errors on the sample that you already see or not. And it turns out that if you allow error, then it can generalize to the largest space. Now again, if you don't allow errors, then you end up going back to solving just about 170 instances. So each of these three choices matter quite a bit in the performance of the uh, tech, uh, tool that we have developed. So that kind of gives rise to lots of questions that are out there to uh, look into. First question in the case of verification or symbolic reasoning formal methods uh, field uh, in general, is there has been a lot of focus on abstraction. So you start with sound abstractions and you slowly repair them. But perhaps relying on approximations using data-driven techniques to first come up with some so listen, that is close, and then relying on formal method technique to repair may be a much better approach. We focus on the problems that were in the propositional setting or in the Boolean setting. Of course, not everything that one cares about can be written in Boolean or a discrete domain. So you need constraints or continuous domain and constraints over time. So extending these approaches to this uh, setting would be interesting. At the same time, I think there's a lot of interesting questions that uh, go back to the machine learning community. A lot of theory that has been developed has been in the case of that there's an underlying function. So for every input, there's a, a one possible label. The setting that we have here is that for every input or every evaluation of the feature, there may be many possible labels and all of them are acceptable. So that gives rise to the question that What's kind of the ideal distribution to generate the data? What are uh, theoretical bounds one can establish? As we are going to uh, look into this in uh, lifting these techniques to more expressive theories, then naturally uh, building on neural networks is uh, the approach given their power to be able to handle data over more expressive theories. Then it gives rise to the question, what's the uh, ideal way of designing loss functions in the case where there is no one ground truth. So imagine the case that for every evaluation to the feature, there are many possible equally acceptable uh, labels. So how do you go and design the loss functions in those cases? A meta uh, point that I wanted to uh, uh, convey here is, I think 
combining machine, formal methods and machine learning techniques can lead to a lot of advances. In particular, what we saw is that the proposed solutions by machine learning don't have to be fully correct. In fact, in earlier parts of the project, earlier stages of the project, we tried very hard to generate more data, to use different learning techniques to get it fully correct just by using data-driven approaches. And that did not work out very well. So what we can do is that you can use machine learning to quickly find some good solution and then rely on formal methods to ensure full correctness. In particular, you can get to the point where the function that we have are certifiably correct. So with that, let me conclude. I talked about uh, the approach uh, to one particular problem, which is a very fundamental problem been studied for nearly 150 years uh, called functional synthesis in the Boolean setting. Talked about our approach, which starts with relied on sampling, uses decision trees and followed by decision list uh, for learning and uh, the advances in symbolic reasoning uh, to be able to repair the initial candidate solutions uh, found by um, the machine learning techniques. It leads to a significant advance over the state of the art, uh, which is why you can see that the EDA community has been very excited about the papers we have. So the papers uh, were recognized as best paper award nomination for two continuous years. So there's a significant uh, improvement over prior state of art, which relied only on the symbolic raising techniques. And there is much more here to do. I think we have barely just started. Uh, the tool that I uh, talked about today is open source. I welcome all of you to give it a try. And with that, I'll be happy to conclude and uh, take any questions. Uh, thanks for being a wonderful audience this morning. Could uh, be very wonderful talk. This is uh, the uh, here. Uh, Sorry, yeah. So, do you think this approach could be ideal for the tiny ML like work where you have uh, very limited data and you are working at the edges where to learn very quickly for a quick solution? Um. Yeah, I mean, in many settings, uh, in many cases, you can think about uh, when you are designing a circuit, then you essentially design a circuit um, in a modular manner, right? And uh, this is really the setting where, uh, you know, these small circuits or the circuit that you are, I mean, it's, I don't think of you being able to design a full uh, large circuit directly, but if you are designing the circuits um, that are going to be embedded, then this is one, certainly an approach to uh, do so. Um, that doesn't directly answer your question about whether it can be used for uh, learning on the edge. Um, possibly, yes. I, I mean, I think what is interesting here is this combination of initially learn something and then try to go and repair it so that you can have formal guarantees. So what we are not trying to do is to just learn something and say that, hey, this is 95%, 98% accurate. Uh, I mean, I think it's possible to get 100% accuracy and have best of both worlds. Let me add some follow-up to that, Cody. What is the time it takes to run uh, solvers? I know you said, I think you mentioned uh, speed at some point. I know that yes. the underlying thing is for you how to scale these up, but um, how how quick are they in terms of uh, coming to the solutions that you want? And would you see these solvers being able to fit in a compact? Because decision trees, like as you said, like you know those two level decision trees, they can keep growing, right? Uh, not keep growing based on the number of inputs you have. So I was just wondering in terms of form factor and in terms of speed, if you can have some comments. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think that this is a point that I uh, wanted to uh, remark further. So, um, you know, there are two aspects to it. One, uh, of course, uh, I hope everybody in the room knows about, 
is familiar with the advances in machine learning, but there's a similar uh, speed up that we uh, observed in uh, symbolic reasoning in terms of, especially in the design of constraint solvers. So in past uh, three decades, the constraint solvers have become, you know, somewhere one would say about a million times uh, faster. So if you, uh, but these problems are hard. So one, it's okay to take a while to solve it. I mean, when you are synthesizing a circuit, there's a lot of uh, time that you have to. So the entire process takes about, you know, somewhere close to few minutes, a uh, few tens of minutes. What surprised us when we have been work, when we worked, um, you know, when we started working on this project, that you would think that we are making lots of very hard queries. So if you are from symbolic reasoning background, you would think about set as a really hard problem. Then we call a max set oracle. Then we call what are these unset core or abductive explanation. And so these are really, really hard problems. And I expected that we would spend most of the time in the repair phase or in the data generation phase. Because again, given the set of constraints, sampling from set of constraints is again a very hard problem. It turns out we spend most of our time, somewhere close to 70 to 80% in learning. And this is very surprising and frustrating at the same time. And I think opportunities for a lot of work here. So here's the setting that we are looking at. We want to learn these decision trees. You have the features, so you have about uh, you know, four, five, 10,000 uh, binary features. And we have about, let's say 2,000 uh, binary labels, okay? And we would like to learn a decision tree for each of them. And turns out there are no efficient parallel methods, there are no efficient techniques out there to be able to do it fast. We tried with quite a, you know, quite a few ideas. So there's a lot of work that can be done in the setting of parallelizing uh, learning over where the set of features, feature labels is large. Um, so if uh, I, I'd be very interested in, in collaborating on this line of work. It, it just seems like interesting problem out there that hasn't been attacked to satisfaction. And we have our, so a lot of uh, benchmarks that we are not able to handle. It's mostly because learning is really slow here. It's not learning is not very accurate. It's just because it is very, very slow. Um, so yeah, I think uh, one really interesting advance uh, would be to be able to learn, suppose you want to learn uh, when the set of, so remember you have the labels with the labels can be specified by, um, you know, 2000 bits. So the space of all possible levels is very large. So you can't just directly try to learn one decision uh, uh, tree. So you had to learn a decision tree for every uh, variable or every dimension one by one. But uh, that kind of gives rise to challenges in parallelization because what, what works better is that you don't want to learn Y1, Y2, all of them just in terms of X1, uh, then it becomes very hard to learn. So you learn, let's say Y1 in terms of X1, X2, and then you learn Y2 in terms of X1, X2, and Y1. So I think there is there's just a lot to do here in this case. Uh, there was a... A uh, question about, uh, did we try with, so yeah, some things that I didn't touch upon. One, I thought that a lot of people in audience might be anywhere too bored with a uh, lot of talks on neural networks. So yes, we did try using neural networks. It did not help us very much. Uh, the reason is, I mean, one possible explanation is uh, it's a very discrete domain, discrete data, and uh, not, not kind of the setting where the neural networks do well. Uh, we also tried with binarized neural networks. Uh, it did not uh, improve um, on uh, the training required way more samples. If we did with fewer samples, it did not work very well. Um, and uh, the yeah, so in different stages, we did try uh, different ideas. 
But the fact that it didn't work well in case of Boolean doesn't mean that it wouldn't work well when we are looking at more expressive continuous domains. So you can, the same problem has been again well studied in uh, formal methods design, uh, I mean, design automation much more in the controls where uh, the specification is not over Boolean, but over continuous domains. Suppose you want to encode uh, the dynamics of uh, vehicles. Uh, so of course you will have to write constraints over continuous domain. And that's where there is some recent promising results coming from machine learning literature uh, in case of partial dif uh, differential equations and so on. So I think there's an opportunity to plug combine those ideas, combine the ideas in the um, hybrid systems controls uh, community and trying to synthesize systems that whose specifications are, are our much more expressive theories. Sorry, I can't. I think there's somebody's uh, voice assistant got activated, uh, but that's not a question, I guess. So. Thank you so much, Kuldi, for sharing uh, your findings. And this is a very uh, interesting problem space and I think a difficult space as well. And the applications both on the hardware side and machine learning side seems to be immense. Um, I'm sure there are some of the matrix uh, faculty who would like to follow up and probably there could be potential collaborations. But thank yes. you. Definitely. I am. I mean, I'm very happy to collaborate and uh, look forward to if you have more questions, comments, uh, interest in collaboration, please do write to me. Yeah. Thank you.